This lesson is create a minimal web API server. The objectives for this lesson are to create a minimal web API server and create endpoints for get, post, put, and delete. If you're not familiar with the minimal web API, check out my course at this URL. Basically, a minimal web API is where you create HTTP endpoints with minimal dependencies. This is a lot easier to use than MVC web API controller model. There's no more coding by convention. You're eliminating controller classes as endpoints. It's really good to use with microservices, applications with few endpoints like what we're gonna be doing in here, and use these when you don't need a full featured application. Let's go ahead and create our minimal web API server. Open up Visual Studio 2022 or VS Code and let's create a new project. And what you're gonna to wanna to use is the ASP.NET Core Web API. So make sure you choose that particular template. Click Next. Let's give it a name of fetchsamples.webapi. I'm gonna put mine on my D drive underneath my samples folder, but feel free to put it wherever you would like. I like to put the solution and the project in the same directory, but again, not a big deal. Whichever one you wanna choose is just fine. I'm gonna be using .NET 8. Again, feel free to use whatever you want to use. And again, if you wanna configure for HTTPS, that's fine. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. It works either way. I would recommend you enable the open API support. Make sure you uncheck do not use top level statements and uncheck use controllers. Once you've done all of this, go ahead and hit create. It does come with a template in here for building a weather forecast. So make sure that you can run this. And once it comes up, this is the open API support that allows you to try out any endpoints you have created. And you can see this one that Microsoft supplies for us gives us back a list of temperatures. We're not gonna use Microsoft's weather forecast, so let's add our own JSON file to supply data for when we make our calls from the Fetch API. Right mouse click on the project and let's add a new folder. I'm gonna call it assets. Then right mouse click on the assets folder and create a new item and we're gonna call it people.json and go ahead and click add on that. And I'm gonna add in several person objects. So you can see here, we've got a person ID, we've got a first name, a last name, an email address, and a start date. And again, if you download the labs for this course, you will find all of this there. So I've got about 19 different persons in our JSON file here. Next, we're gonna create an entity class in C-sharp to map that JSON to. Once again, right mouse click on the project and let's add another new folder. This one will be called Entity Classes. Right mouse click on that and let's add a class and we'll call it Person. And what we're gonna do is give it a namespace of fetchsamples.webapi. We're gonna create a public class called Person. Inside of here, I'm gonna have a person ID, a first name, a last name, an email address, and a start date. These all match up with the exact same properties that I had here in each of these individual JSON objects. In order to take advantage of dependency injection, I'm gonna create an interface for the repository class and all these repository classes I might create in the future that we're gonna to use to read those JSON files. Once again, right mouse click on our project and let's add a new folder. This one will be called interfaces right mouse click on that new folder and let's create a new item. We'll call it I repository. Let's go ahead and add that. And what we're gonna do is, remember I said we're gonna create a CRUD web page eventually. So that means we need a method to get. We need a method to get a single object. We need a method to insert, update, and delete. So if we're gonna create a set of repository classes that are in charge of doing all of this, we wanna map them to an interface so that we can take advantage of dependency injection. Let's now create that repository object to read our JSON file. 
Right mouse click on the project and add another new folder. And we'll call this repository classes. And let's add another class and this one will be called person repository. We'll add this. And now as you can see, I've added a lot of lines of code here, but this is very, very simple code. So I've got a using on the system.text.json and putting everything into the same namespace. I then have my public class person repository that implements that I repository, telling the repository that I'm going to use a person object. If we take a look at the first method here, private string, get people from file, his job is actually to go out, use the current directory, add on the assets people.json, ensure that that file exists, and then read all the text. So it's reading in all that people.json. Let's next take a look at the save people to file, where what you're going to do is pass in a list of people. You're going to get the file name again and the directory to the people.json. We're going to set up a JSON serializer option because I want everything in camel case and I want to write indented as true. I'm then going to perform JSON serializer.serialize. I'm going to serialize the collection of people objects or person objects, passing in the options. And if I get back a good serialized set of JSON, if the file exists, we're going to write all the text back out. Now, I want to say something. This is very single user focused right now. You would never do this in a production app because you'd have multiple users coming in and multiple users trying to write to the same file at the same time is not going to work. This is only for illustration purposes here in this course. Let's next take a look at the get method. The get method, his job is to get that collection of JSON and deserialize it into a list of person objects that we can return when we want to see the whole list of persons in that people.json. Now I'm not going to go through every line of code here. This is all very boilerplate. I'm doing a get people from file. I'm doing the JSON serializer. I'm doing a deserialize on that people that I've got back from the file. And I then return that because it's deserialized in a collection of list of persons. For the get, passing in the ID, I'm going to go ahead and get the data, and then I'm going to do a where the person ID is equal to the ID that's passed in. And I'm going to do a first or default to get that specific person. I then have an insert method to which we pass in a new person entity. I'm going to increment the primary key field and then add one so I can get the person ID for the new user going in. And then I add that to the collection and then I save the people back. For the update, pretty much the same thing. I go out, I get the person that we are wanting to update. So I get that. I replace the data coming in that I'm passing in through the API, taking those values from that entity and putting it into the current version. And then again, saving the complete list back to the people.json. Of course, I have a delete as well. And the delete, I pass in again a person entity. I go look up to find out if I can find that particular person that this one's wanting to delete. If it is, I remove it, and then I save all the collection of people back to the file. So there we go, a simple repository class. Again, illustrative purposes only for this course. You would not want to use this in a production website. We are going to be creating a separate website for the Fetch API where our JavaScript is then going to be calling this website, which is different. So that is cross origin, right? So it's two different domains theoretically, even though we're going to be running on localhost here. But you figure that you want to implement the cross origin resource sharing or cores. Let's add that to our program.cs at this point. Go back to the program.cs up towards the top here right after the create builder, we're going to add cores. And we're going to set up a cores polity where we're going to simply allow any origin, allow any header, and allow any method. Again, this is kind of making things wide open just for illustrative purposes in this course. What we then want to do is scroll down to where the, you see the app.run back here. And right before we do the app.run, we want to enable authorization and then enable our cores middleware. Okay, so we're almost done creating the web API, just a few more steps. 
First thing I want to tell you is don't return just a list of person objects or a list of customer objects or a list of employee objects or a single person or a single customer object. I recommend creating a response class where you can wrap up the data like the person object or the persons collection plus additional information such as the HTTP status code, the status text, a message that might be your own unique message that you want to pass down, and then into a data property you pass the payload to return that list of persons or list of customers or the single customer or the single person. So I would highly recommend create a response class. So let's create that now. Right mouse click on the entity classes folder and let's add a class. We will call it response. Click add. What we're going to put into our public class response is a public int status. That'll be your HTTP status code. So it'll be from 100 to 599. The status text that goes along with that status code. Any message that you might want to include. And then a public object data that can or cannot be null. So we may be able to pass back null. We maybe are not passing back data. So maybe you're doing a 204, no content. Okay, but otherwise you'd be passing back a list of persons or a list of customers or etc. All right, now we're ready to create our CRUD Web API endpoints using the minimal Web API. Go back to program.cs, and the first thing let's do, let's get rid of all this stuff that has to relate to that weather forecasting that Microsoft has put in. So now our program.cs is very small. So now let's go and add some Web API endpoints. I want to add just a couple here to start. And we're going to put them right before the app.run here. Let's take a look at what these do. So our first one, starting on line 39, app.mapget slash API slash people. So it'll be our local host colon whatever the port number is slash API slash people will be able to get to this endpoint. And then it runs the code within this anonymous function here. So the first thing I have is an I result. I want to return an I result from this. And the I result would be something like an OK and not found, things like that. Then, as you can see, I'm creating a list of persons, creating my person repository. I call the repo.get, which gets the whole collection of people from my people.json and returns it back as a list of person objects. If the list comes back and the count is greater than zero, I'm going to go ahead and create this I result equal to results.ok. And I'm going to create a new response object to pass back with that. So the results that okay gives me the 200, but I'm still going to create my response and I'm going to put the status of 200, the status text of okay, message is I'm going to put all people retrieved. So I might be able to use that then on my website somehow if I'm calling this and wanting to display that. And then I take the list and I put it into that data property. If the list.count comes back as equal to zero, that means there were no people in that JSON file. I'm going to set that return result equal to results.notfound, new response, status 404, status text not found, and the message will be no people available, and I set the data equal to null. And then that's what I return from this get. The next one allows me to pass in a ID for a specific person. So I'd be passing in the person ID of the one I want to retrieve. I again create an I result. This time I create a person entity. I create my person repository, and then I do entity equals repo.get, passing in the ID. Now, if the entity comes back and it's not equal to null, that means I found it. So I'll go ahead and set the return result equal to results.ok, again, creating a new response object with the 200, the ok, and person retrieved, and the data set to that entity that we got back. Otherwise, I'll do another not found. And look at the message. It simply says can't find person with the ID equal to, and then I tell them what ID they were searching for, and that then gets returned from this endpoint. So if we've done everything successfully, let's go ahead and run our website. The Open API will then read these two endpoints and present them to me here on this web page that it builds. So if I come and I say try it out and I click on execute, we should see now that I get that response object back. Now notice the code I'm still getting from the results.ok. I'm still getting a code of 200, which is what I want. But the response body that's coming back is actually my response object with the status, 
status text, the message, and the data. And feel free to add any additional properties that you want into your response object. Then, of course, down here we can do our get passing in an ID. So it asks me for an ID. I'll go ahead and choose number one. We'll click on the execute here. And now you can see that the data property is now filled in with just a single person object that got returned to us. So this lesson, you learned a little bit about minimal APIs. We created a minimal web API server. We created a JSON file for some data. We created a repository object to read the file. And then we created our set of web API endpoints. And again, see my YouTube video on minimal web APIs if you've not used this technology before. We don't really need to understand a lot about what's going on here to learn about the Fetch API. I just needed to set up a web API server. Coming up next, use the Fetch API to get data.